Hello, family, and welcome. We're here at the Castle of Loyola, where St. Ignatius was born, where he was converted, here in northern Spain. Join us today and study our super saint, Ignatius of Loyola, soldier, poet, mystic, author, defender of the faith, and founder of the Society of Jesus. It was 1491, the year before Columbus was sent to America to, to the New World by the Catholic Queen and King, Ferdinand and Isabella. For nearly 700 years, Spaniards could not worship in Catholic churches. They were not allowed to receive the sacraments. Religious and clergy were exiled, imprisoned, or killed. All mention of Jesus was forbidden under the penalty of death. Spain survived this physical and spiritual domination only to face another attack, a new attempt to destroy the church. As the enemy of God is raising up men who would bring about a revolution called the Reformation, God is calling forth soldiers to counteract this revolt, an army of saints which would bring about a counter-reformation. The life of one such saint begins in the castle of Loyola, Ignatius coming from a long line of nobility. From the very beginning, God had a plan for him. He was sent to his aunt's castle where he received a solid Christian education. An avid reader, Ignatius' taste leaned towards tales of valor and honor. So it is no surprise we find him leaving to engage in his first battle, the defense of Navarre. The attack was suppressed, but the French renewed their offensive, recaptured Navarre, and laid siege on Pamplona. Although heavily outnumbered, Ignatius convinced the other Spanish soldiers to defend the fort. The walls of the fortress began to crumble beneath the furious battery of cannonballs striking at its foundation. Ignatius fought courageously. Right up to the moment, a cannonball shattered the bone of his right leg and seriously injured the other. When he fell, the others surrendered and the French soldiers captured the fort. But seeing how bravely he had fought, the French had their physicians attend him for close to 15 days. Realizing their limits, the French had a litter made to carry the brave little soldier home. Barely five foot two inches, his small frame bobbing up and down on the litter, his red hair matted by sweat pouring down onto his face from the intense pain, Ignatius never let out a cry. At the castle of Loyola, the doctors decided the bones had not set properly. They had to be broken again. Brave knight, he asked for no anesthetic and went through the operation with his hands and teeth clenched. He grew weaker and weaker. The doctors advised him he was dying. Ignatius asked for the last rites of the church. He would not last the night, but he passed the crisis at midnight, the feast, the eve of the feast of Saints Peter and Paul. Ignatius had a great devotion to St. Peter. Historians all agree St. Peter appeared to Ignatius and told him he would be cured. The bones were straightened out at last, but the operation left him with one leg shorter than the other. His recovery was slow and arduous. Ignatius had an active mind, but it was locked up inside a body which was betraying him. But he could read. He requested books on knighthood and ladies of the court. But in the castle, there were only books on the life of Jesus and of the saints. Soon he found contemplating things of the world gave him pleasure only to fade away in the light of what he was reading. He was discovering a new world and a new battlefield. The lives of Jesus and the saints became strategic maps, revealing the great battles to be waged to gain eternal victory. All the vainglory he had sought in the past went up like so much smoke when he discovered there was only one true lasting glory, a soul pure and like unto God. As Ignatius was pleading with God to show him he had accepted him, a tremor shook the house. He took this as a sign God was showing him it was he directing his life. Then Our Lady appeared with the baby Jesus in her arms. She said nothing, but her presence filled him with a sweet peace unlike anything he had ever known. She gave him a gift that would remain with him forever. She filled his soul with the purity of the angels. He lost all desire for things of the world. His days and nights filled with grace upon grace, God was preparing Ignatius to share in his passion, his rejection, his abandonment. 
Having beheld heaven, he wept, Oh, how vile this earth seems when I look at heaven. Detachment from earth and its temptations, focusing on heaven alone would be the first of his spiritual exercises. He wrote, The end of man is not to serve the creature, but God the Creator and him alone. Saying farewell to his family was not easy. They didn't understand. He left for Montserrat. Now, Montserrat is an extremely high mountain, the climb perilous at best. Before attempting it, Ignatius stopped at the church. He confessed his sins and plans to a holy monk, who then asked if, as an act of total abandonment, he could leave his mule at the monastery. Receiving a yes, he pressed on. If you are truly dependent on the Lord, can you leave your only means of defense, your sword and dagger, at the altar of Our Lady? Ignatius said yes. It was the Feast of the Annunciation, and Ignatius stood guard over his lady, keeping the night watch of arms, the ancient practice of the knights, before receiving their final war regalia. But his regalia was not that of a knight. It was the tattered robe of a pilgrim. Rather than his satin sash, his waist was bound with a rough cord. His fine leather boots he replaced with hemp slip-ons. His leg not entirely healed, he balanced himself precariously on one foot, steadying himself with a roughly whittled walking stick. With the rising of a new day, the night of the house of Loyola was no more. This night would fight the impossible fight only for the Lord and his mother. Staff in hand and solely a shell to scoop water from a brook, he was ready, onward to Montserrat. After Montserrat, he was too sick to go on. Some fine women brought him to a hospital in Manresa. Life in Manresa was simple. Ignatius attended mass daily, participated in Vespers, and received Holy Communion once a week. He prayed on his knees as much as seven hours a day. He really slept, scourged himself, begged for a small dry piece of bread, and drank a bit of water. His pilgrim's robe, not penance enough, he wore a hair shirt. He served the poor and the sick of the hospital, choosing those with the worst diseases. He kept the company of beggars, but no one took him to be a beggar. Consequently, the children made fun of him. Ignatius discovered a cave which became a lonely battlefield. Temptations of one kind or the other besieged him. One of the severest duels of his life, it seemed as if he were fencing with the Prince of Darkness himself, God's holy night falling only to rise to fight another battle. This would fill a spiritual well with teachings from which not only Jesuits would draw life-giving water of knowledge and strength, but those who would read the spiritual exercises and follow Ignatius to a deeper life with God. Finger of God, he would say. God treated him as a wise master does a child, to whom he gives little to learn at a time and before whom he does not place a second lesson until he has well understood the first. Ignatius had visions of the serpent before he had heavenly ecstasies. One night, while recuperating in the hospital in Manresa, a glowing figure appeared. He could not make it out, only that it dimly resembled a serpent. Blend, blinding lights resembling many eyes shot forth. The figure left only to return over and over again. Ignatius began to look forward to its reappearance, feeling an unexplainable attraction toward it. But the Lord provided him ammunition to fight the devil. God infused him with such knowledge. If he were to add all he had received his entire life, it would not equal what he had learned in that one moment. When he came out of the ecstasy, he ran to the cross and was kneeling before Jesus crucified when all of a sudden the figure appeared. Only now, in the true light of the cross, Ignatius perceived clearly it was the father of deception who had been appearing to him. Although the vision persisted appearing again and again, now Ignatius was able to quickly discern who it was and dispel him, at times attacking the vision with his bare hands and other times disdainfully shooing him away with his walking stick. Reciting the little office of the Blessed Virgin, he had a vision of the Holy Trinity, which had such a profound effect on him, he entered into an intimacy with the triune God. Later in life, it would be the center of his prayer life and revelations. 
He had a vision of heaven, and along with others who have seen heaven, he couldn't put into words what it was like. When the host was raised in consecration, he had a vision of the child Jesus, who revealed how he was present in the sacred host after the consecration. He had interior visions of the God-man Jesus, seeing him with the eyes of his heart between 20 to 40 times. He had visions of the Blessed Mother. While in the hospital, he went into ecstasy for a whole week, laying in bed as if dead with the faintest heartbeat. Eyewitnesses at his bedside reported he came to as if from a deep sleep and cried out over and over again, Oh, Jesus, Jesus. It is believed it was then he received the word to establish the company of Jesus. For when he was writing the Constitution, he said he was including passages given to him at Manresa. Young men flocked to him, but for as many as loved him, hated him. And so they maligned Ignatius and all who befriended him. He had no recourse. He left Manresa with the patched clothes of a pauper and the love and prayers of all whom he had touched. When asked to take a companion, he explained, if I took a companion, I would be looking to him for food when hungry, and if I fell, would look to him to lift me up, and would thus be learning to rest in him, whereas I desire only to love and look up to God and put all my hope and confidence in him. His heart sad at leaving so many dear ones his soul soared at being one step closer to his dream to convert unbelievers in the Holy Land. He set out for Rome. Fearing he was carrying the plague, he was refused admission. But when Ignatius explained he was not ill but exhausted from his long trip, he was allowed to enter Rome. After receiving the Pope's blessing, he left for the Holy Land. Poor clothes and equally poor health caused him problems as he traveled. Venice would not allow him to enter without a certificate stating he had a clean bill of health. Too tired to go on, he was spending the night out in the cold when God told him he would protect him. The next day, the guards at the gate did not notice Ignatius entering without papers. Ignatius arrived in the Holy Land. The Franciscans gave him the green light only to have their provincial order him to leave. Ignatius went to Genoa. A war raging, he was first taken prisoner by the Spanish, then released only to be imprisoned by the French. Ignatius arrived in Barcelona the early part of 1524, 33 years old and struggling to learn among much younger students who breezed through their Latin lessons. Ignatius never compromised. Upon learning of nuns who were abusing their vow of closure, allowing even men to visit them in the parlor, he spoke to them and conversions came about. But they were the, there were those who liked the freedom they had. They had him beaten several times. That failing to deter him, they hired two slaves to kill him. They beat him and his companions so brutally, they left the priest dead and Ignatius close to death. As soon as he recovered, he went to the convent. One of the men begged his forgiveness and converted. Ignatius entered the University of Alcala. He became aware of a canon who, having made the acquaintance of wild young men, began living a life unworthy of his vow. When Ignatius knocked on his door, he reluctantly let him in. After hours of reminding him of the price Jesus paid for the salvation of his soul and of those he had been ordained to help, the canon's disdain and anger turned to deep respect he resumed his vocation. Although Ignatius desired to help others unnoticed and unrewarded, he came to the attention of the authorities and was brought before the Inquisition. Finding nothing irregular in his behavior, they turned him over to a doctor of theology who found nothing contrary to the teachings of the church. But the following year, the police arrested him. A mother and a daughter under his spiritual direction ignored the limits he placed on them and began dressing as paupers, begging, going from one hospital to another, caring for the poor and the sick. When he ordered them to cease, they obeyed Ignatius, but later resumed their begging. As the women were from nobility, rather than allow a blemish on their reputation, Ignatius was imprisoned. 
After 42 days, he was found innocent and free to leave. Ignatius left for the University of Salamanca to resume his studies. Students were once again drawn to him. The Dominicans learned of it and drilled him, trying to trap him. After answering a battery of questions brilliantly, Ignatius was placed in prison again. Although he was found innocent of any wrongdoing, he was ordered to cease teaching the difference between venial and mortal sin. As Ignatius believed, if you cannot preach about sin, you cannot call men to conversion, he knew he had to leave for the University of Paris. In Paris, he had to go to begging once again. He studied rhetoric, philosophy, and theology, but he would not complete his studies in the University of Paris because once again, Ignatius would come under attack. Ignatius was 44 years old. Three young men of prestigious families renounced the world, consecrating themselves to a new life of poverty. Ignatius, was accused of witchcraft and brought before the Inquisition. A young man lodging with him took what little alms Ignatius had, spent them frivolously, and then left for Spain. On the way, he became so ill he had to stop in Rouen. He wrote to Ignatius begging for help. His health poor, barely able to stand, before the sun rose the next day, Ignatius left for Rouen. No sooner had the young man recovered, a messenger brought Ignatius a letter from Paris advising he had been brought before the Inquisition. Ignatius obtained a document certifying he had just received word and was responding immediately to show he had not left Paris to escape appearing at the Inquisition. Arriving in Paris, he immediately appeared before the Inquisitor. Again, he was found blameless, but the damage was done. The three students who had joined him left. But as many students preferred Ignatius' conferences to theirs, the professors were up in arms. When the rector first sent word to Ignatius to present himself in the public hall, where he would be chastised in front of the whole student body, he was willing to submit. But after praying, he realized that this would bring scandal on the spiritual exercises. Ignatius insisted he be brought before the rector, who, upon hearing him, was so moved, he took him by the hand, walked with him to the center of the hall, and begged his forgiveness. Now, professors, too, came to Ignatius. Six students of divinity joined Ignatius, one of them Francis Xavier, although reluctant at first to lead such an austere life, would become known as co-founder of the Jesuits, going where Ignatius had dreamed to convert unbelievers only in India. Not everyone loved Ignatius. A friend of Francis Xavier, hating Ignatius for the change that had come about in his friend and others, stole into his room to assassinate him. A voice remonstrating him froze him on the spot. He did not complete his horrible sin, instead threw himself at Ignatius' feet and begged forgiveness. This man will later accuse Ignatius before an inquisition. The Company of Jesus chose the Feast of the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin to take their vows in the little church of Our Lady of Montmartre. Father Peter Faber, the only priest in their company, celebrated the Mass. Ignatius and his company went on to Rome to get permission from the Pope to go to the Holy Land and receive holy orders under the title of Voluntary Poverty. Pope Paul III invited them to partake in discussions on tenets of the faith with some of his eminent theologians. He listened attentively and then said, I am truly so happy to find so much learning joined to so much humility. If I can assist you in anything, I will do so willingly. The Pope predicted war would break out. It came to pass, and they could not go to the Holy Land. On June 24th, 1537, Ignatius, now 45 years old, and some of his company were ordained priests. He celebrated his first Mass at the Chapel of the Holy Crib in the Church of St. Mary Major in Rome sighing it was the closest he would come to Bethlehem. Ignatius and his company were given a deserted convent without windows or furnishings where they slept on the floor. Ignatius began speaking of God and the faithful always hungering for the divine, the numbers grew and so did the avarice and jealousy. Once more, Ignatius is called before the Inquisition. Although the accusations had been discredited by the Inquisition in Paris, 
Ignatius insisted on having a certificate drawn which would formally affirm his innocence. He got his wish, was again exonerated, and his doctrine declared irreproachable. In Vicenza, Ignatius gave his company the name the Society of Jesus, telling them, taking Jesus as their chief and model, they were to go and bring the good news to all the world. They went to Rome. Ignatius had a vision at La Storta, a village six miles from Rome. God imprinted on his mind, I will be favorable to you in Rome. Then Jesus appeared, carrying the cross. Walking beside him, God the Father told our Lord, I will that thou take this man for thy servant. And then Jesus told Ignatius, I will that thou serve me. Once again, Ignatius is accused of heresy, found innocent, and after appealing to Pope Paul III, is officially exonerated. Famine devastates Rome, and Ignatius and his company pick up the dying and the starving people of Rome from out of the gutters, bring them into their modest convent, and share what little they have to eat. The rich, seeing these men tending the poor, were moved to pity and began contributing to the cause. The first draft of their constitution was approved. When it was time for the little company to elect a superior, to his deep consternation, Ignatius was unanimously elected a superior. When he implored them to vote again, the results were the same. The cheering finally subsiding, it was time for them to take their solemn vows at the church of St. Paul outside the walls. When it was time for Ignatius to give communion to his brothers, he raised the host above the pattern and intoned aloud their vows, doing so for each of his brothers before they received their beloved Lord in the Eucharist. With this act of love and adoration, they were pledging their lives to their Lord present among them. It was to him they were making their vows, and it was fitting it be in this chapel where he reigned and where his most precious mother was present. Joined in this holy endeavor, the army of Jesus was ready to serve and die for their church and her vicar if need be. The mass over, they embraced Ignatius and one another, tears unashamedly spilling from their eyes. There was a need to help the helpless and forgotten. Ignatius opened St. Martha, a house for penitents and prostitutes. Now there was a man living in sin with another man's wife. Through Ignatius, she repented and entered the house of St. Martha. The man bore charges against Ignatius. As he was a man of influence, he soon turned many of Ignatius' benefactors against him. Ignatius insisted the matter be investigated. The Pope's vicar came to the house of St. Martha, and again Ignatius' teachings were found in order. The woman in question and her husband, being of nobility, asked Ignatius to quietly accept Matthias' apology and let the matter rest. But Ignatius insisted the tribunal judge the matter. And again, all allegations against Ignatius were found false. Matthias was chastised by the court and made to absorb the course of the tribunal. He converted and became a benefactor. Ignatius founded a house for catechumens. The priest in charge of the house, because of jealousy, filed false charges, accusing him of heresy and breaking the seal of confession. The result was the priest was found guilty of wrongdoing. He lost his faculties. The court sentenced him to life imprisonment. But through Ignatius' intercession, it was reduced to exile. Early in 1555, Ignatius began to show signs of going home. Although most of his life he was on the edge, holding on with his fingernails, this was different. He had no more to give, but give he would till he closed his eyes for the last time. In 1556, his days numbered, he wrote to a dear friend, promising to continue praying for her godson, only soon in heaven. As if leaving his last will and testament, he told his company, I have desired above all other three things, and thanks to God, I see them all accomplished. That the company should be confirmed by the Pope, that the book of the spiritual exercises should be approved by the Holy See, and thirdly, that the Constitution should be completed and observed in the whole society. The day before he died, he asked Father Polanco to send a message to His Holiness that he was dying, and to ask him for a blessing for himself and Father Olav, who was also dying. He said to tell His Holiness if he had the grace to go to heaven, he would pray for him, as he did on earth while alive. 
Thinking he was not seriously ill as he talked with him and ate a good deal that evening, Father Polanco thought it best to wait till Friday to notify the Holy See. The next morning it was obvious the Holy Knight was dying. His agony lasted a short time. The Pope was notified and with much grief gave him the apostolic blessing for his last voyage home. Ignatius went peacefully to his beloved mother Mary and her son Jesus. It was the last day of July, 1556. Ignatius, priest, founder, and knight was canonized in 1622. Sleep well, loyal and holy knight of the papacy. Sadly, there is not enough time to go into all his struggles, being accepted and then rejected, accused and then exonerated to be accused again. But through it all, he remained a loyal son of the church. Born at the same time as one of the deadliest movements to attack Mother Church, God raised up a giant. He truly was a servant of Jesus. I know of no one in the history of the church who had more reason to give up. But Ignatius persisted. A soldier, he fought the impossible fight and left his sons this heritage to challenge them and fortify them. We leave you with the vow that St. Ignatius and his followers took. I, the undersigned, promise to Almighty God and to the Pope, his vicar upon earth, in the presence of the Blessed Virgin, his mother, and in the presence of the society, perpetual poverty, chastity, and obedience, according to the form contained in the bull of the Society of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the constitutions already published or which shall be published afterwards. I promise moreover particular obedience to the Pope with regard to the mission spoken of in the bull. I promise likewise to take care that the youth be instructed in the doctrines of the faith according to the same bull and the constitutions given at Rome Friday the 22nd of April in the Church of St. Paul outside the walls. Let St. Ignatius of Loyola guide you in your battle to defend the Church of the Third Millennium. We love you. God bless you. Write us at the address on our screen or call us in the United States at 1-800-633-2484. We love you.